life in the cloud. Very different after decades of having your software and data in your office or in your own data center. Today, you're going to hear one executive's experiences after living in the cloud for three years. Welcome to Firing Line. I'm Bill Kudyk. Joining me now is Rob Arbogast, head of global HR systems for the Timken Company, the 100-year-old world leader in friction management. I just love that term, <laughs> friction management. Timken designs, engineers, and manufactures bearings found in everything from jet engines and automobiles to heavy equipment and weed whackers. Rob is a 32-year veteran of this global company. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Thank you, Bill. Happy to be here. Rob, you had a very unusual situation. You took the company from a full-blown Tesseract mainframe HRMS package to an equally full-blown cloud core HR and payroll. While that probably isn't happening all that often, I think your experience <laughs> anymore, I think your experiences are not that different from people who are on on-prem, more modern systems, thinking about moving to the cloud. So be ruthless and tell us the one major difference that everybody out there who's thinking about it, you think needs to know. Bill, it's the update cycles. It's the innovations. Uh, Tezzerec, PeopleSoft, all those guys, right? You come out with an update every two to three years. And in fact, we all kind of just have IT take care of that. And it happens and it's done and you're, you're moving along. With the new packages, we have an innovation cycle every quarter. That means our software has opportunity for us every quarter. So what, what we've done is we try to take advantage of that because that's the value. That's why you buy these SaaS packages. Every quarter we have the opportunity to help the business grow, to help the business change. Are any employees complaining about the software changing on them? No. Four times a year? <laughs> no, they, they, they don't. You know, it's just like everything else in the new world. It changes all the time and we're at that same pace. That's, that's great. Compliance, compliance is a big issue, I think. Yeah. Tell us about it. So, so we thought compliance was going to be something that wouldn't be that big of a deal because we had processes and procedures and we, we used them and we worked them. But all of a sudden, we changed everything. Our HCM is in the cloud, our payroll's in the cloud, our data's in the cloud, our interface engine's in the cloud, and we, everything changed. And so we had to work with our internal auditing and our external auditing on how to actually become very compliant. In fact, now we rely on our provider, our software solution provider, to help us with that. They need to give us the information to show us as compliant. They need to make sure it's very timely so that we can meet all of our financial needs. Just like Mike Etling was saying on an earlier program about having to act more like an outsourcer. Mike and I've talked about that numerous times. So tell me, everybody, I th it seems, faces some opposition to the cloud when it first comes up. Probably less now than it was three years ago when you, when you did it, but tell us where the opposition came from and how you dealt with it. Opposition came from just about everybody. <laughs> so if you look at the IT side, IT really had issues around security and privacy. The HR side had issues about the data being out in the cloud. The geographies, Europe, they had problems with Safe Harbor and PII, and the list just keeps going on. So we were really perplexed. We, we didn't know what to do. And we were sitting in a room one day talking about interfaces, and it hit us. We already send out a lot of our information outside of the firewall. And so what we did is we listed it out. And it didn't take us long until we had like 90, 100 different data elements that we were sending out. And that was what helped us. We then figured out our risk profile didn't change. Interesting. Finally, to help those in the audience who are facing or avoiding facing uh, this decision, uh, tell us the, the pain point that finally made Timken take the leap. Basically, we didn't have the tools necessary to support the business. So, global employees, needing to have deep, rich talent pools, you know, needing to ha have something that would help the business continue to grow like analytics. We didn't have that capability. So we knew we needed to do something. And we tried with our old Tezzerex system, we built .NEPs on it, we tried everything, but we just couldn't get there. So that was what really helped us get to that point of, 
let's go get something to help the business. Rob, thanks for joining us today and being so open and honest about this transition that a lot of people are facing. I think you've helped them. Thank you, Bill. To make sure you don't miss the next firing line, please click the red box at the end of the show to subscribe. You'll get just one email reminder for each episode. Thank you for watching. I'm Bill Cuter.